Hello, and you're listening to Polemics Report for December 27, 2018. This is your host, J.D. Hall. This is the program we hope will be glorifying to God, convicting the sinners, and edifying to the saints, a program with sincere questions and biblical answers. Thanks so much for listening in. Do you know what Pulpit and Pin is? Pulpit and Pin is the Rolex of Polemics blogs. Uh, it's more than a Polemics blogs, uh, blog. In fact, it is really the Rolex of Christian news sites that are polemic-y flavored. Is that a word? Polem- is it polemic or polemically? Polemically. That sounds better. It's polemically flavored. Polemics is the field of theological study in which we take what people are saying in the name of God, and then we compare that to the Word of God to see if what they're telling us is so. We want to be Bereans, more noble than those in Thessalonica, because we're actually seeing if what we're being told is so biblically. We take what someone says in the left hand, we compare it to what God says in the right hand. We're to train the powers of our discernment with constant practice so that we might be skilled in the word of righteousness. The goal of polemics is to defend the truth, right? You understand that? Our goal is to defend the truth of Scripture by pointing out that which is false. And so we have Polemics Report as the podcast. Pulpit and Pen is the website. If you want to hang out with us on Facebook, you can join the Pulpit Bunker. This is listener-supported radio, and everything we do is listener-supported. And so you can donate at Patreon. For $49.95 a month, you get free books in the mail. This week, uh, or rather this month, we're getting, you are getting two books in the mail. One is uh, by Machen on Christianity and Liberalism, and the other book is called Christianity and the Craft by Seth Dunn, which is about Freemasonry. So if you are a Patreon supporter, you get two free books in the mail that, now that I think about it, it's really not that free because you're paying for it, but it helps support pulpit and pen. Uh, you can also give thirty four ninety five a month, and you don't get anything for that except when you first join, you get a free t-shirt. So that's exciting. From the Reformed Gear store online or $5.95 a month just to show us that you love us and you're here to support us. Uh, Leave a positive review on iTunes. Join the Pulpit Bunker. Did I say that already? Um, Share our stuff so that we can navigate around the Facebook throttle. They still do it, but not as bad. Usually it's on posts relating to the LGBTQ, XYZ, and LMNOP uh, community community. Um, And that helps us get around that filter. Also, there was a tiny, cute little boycott. It was the cutest little boycott. Cutest little boycott you ever seen. Cutest little boycott. Um, By Dave Miller and some of the social justice warriors that are like, hey, don't share pulpit and pen stuff so that we stop giving them a platform. Um, It didn't really work. We had a fantastic week. And 2018 has been a fantastic fantastic uh, year for pulpit and pen and December was a great month. It still helps to have as many supporters as we can possibly get sharing our material. And you can do that on Twitter, Facebook, all your social media platforms. Uh, And uh, I guess that's it. If you're listening, you're listening on the Bible thumping wingnut, the Bible thumping wingnut. Tell us where you're from in the comments, if you would. Bible thumping wingnut, you can join their Facebook, the wingnut wall. It is the marketplace of ideas. The pulpit bunker is a happy place for like-minded people. If you're not like-minded, you get kicked out. But if you're an atheist, agnostic, heretic, and you want to just, I, I don't know, if you just want to go full Richard Dawkins in there, you can. They let you. That's the marvelous thing about Bible thumping wingnut. Support them too if you get half the chance. Uh, so let me see here. What is, what is, what is new at Pulpit and Pen? Oh, this is great. There is a Royal Rumble in Phoenix. Believe it or not, two cosmic forces colliding together to create the perfect polemical storm. Who will win? Uh, who will win? Does it really matter at this point? <laughs> Probably not. Um, I guess. I'll get to the post. Hipster Calvinists versus Fundy Arminian in Religious Phoenix uh, feud. In one corner, we have Steven Anderson, the highly controversial pastor from Tempe, Arizona. If you've not watched him get tased by the border guard, you are missing out, man. It is everything you hoped and dreamed it could be. 
it's just that good a video. He's also known for like taking an AR-15 to political rallies, uh, praying imprecatory prayers for uh, President Obama being banned out, uh, banned or kicked out of uh, four different countries because he's kind of uh, controversial and uh, some insane sermon rants. He actually stands on his pulpit sometimes and screams. Last week, uh, I think Andrew Risco sent me the uh, the, the video. Uh, there's a seven minute clip posted last week of Stephen Anderson yelling at someone in his church, kicking him out of the congregation, which I guess has to be done sometimes, maybe with a little bit more decency and order, but I don't want to throw stones. I don't know exactly what was going on, but he's a highly controversial uh, pastor. And then in the other hand, you have Jeff Durbin, who's, who's kind of a, he's more known for like booze and tattoos uh, as a part of fundraisers for a church plant because of the 2017 beer and tattoos debacle, which would have just gone over in like a week. The controversy would have been over, but James White really likes dragging the controversy out as long as he possibly can. Other than that, Durbin seems like an all right guy. He seems like an, he seems like a nice fellow. Um, I don't know what else to say about Durbin. Um, hipster, I, I I got a little bit of a bone to pick because when he had me come to Phoenix for the theonomy debate with Joel McDermott, Durbin was a theonomist. Uh, Marcus Pittman there with him was a theonomist, although that was before he went to work for Apologia. But um, And then when McDermott left theonomy, Durbin just kind of like, he moonwalked out of the room. Like, I don't know. I was, I was never a theonomist. I wish he would have been more honest about that. He's not confessional. So it was weird that, uh, or I should say the church isn't, maybe he is but one of those things where, well, the church is uh, not confessional. We don't want to be that narrow, but the pastor is, I don't know. I was disappointed to see Dr. White go from a confessional reform Baptist church to a, a non-confessional church. I think every reformed Baptist was disappointed to see that, but that's who Durbin is. Anderson pastors, faithful word, Baptist church. I've been there. I've got a picture uh, behind the pulpit. I just wanted to see it. And one of the things that struck me when I went there is how normal everyone seemed. I wrote a post about this at pulpit and pen, or it might've been polemics report. Uh, it seemed normal. The people seemed normal. And that stood out to me because Stephen Anderson uh, doesn't seem that uh, that normal. The men have been feuding for some time. Uh, it's usually started by Anderson, but then James White will Facebook about it, podcast about it. And again, it gets strung out uh, for weeks or months. The last skirmish began because of a sermon that appears to have been delivered on Sunday, uh, December 23rd. Now, my system is not hooked up. Uh, I've moved things around a little bit. I'm still trying to get it set up better. Um, but I, I'm going to play it on a different Mac. Let me see if I can get to the right place. It's not going to be through the audio. It's going to be terrible quality, but I haven't, I haven't podcasted in a few weeks. So I wanted to get to it even if it's not perfect. Hold on a second. Oh. Okay, did you hear that? Individuals who are homosexual wear a thumb ring to classify their relationship status. So which one? Okay, so Jeff Durbin apparently has a thumb ring. Now I Googled it. I didn't, it didn't come up real quick, but uh, one of the admins, uh, Sherry, said that it did come up as possibly gay. I think it was Urban Dictionary said what it designates is someone is uneducated and probably pretty stupid. It was something like, <laughs> it was something like that. Is that a secret gay thing? I thought it was, hold on a second, an earring in the right ear. Left, right is, left is right, right is wrong. So right, if I'm, if I'm remembering like second grade correctly, an earring in the right ear is gay. I didn't know this about a thumb ring, but he, listen, Dr. MacArthur on occasion throws out Masonic hand signals. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. It's possible maybe Anderson is reading into thumb rings. Now, why would a guy wear a thumb ring? I don't know. I, I Somebody asked Durbin 
Why are you wearing a thumb ring? What's the point of that? I don't think it, it makes him gay, probably. I'm trying to be fair and impartial. Probably not. Of the right ring. Is that the available? That's the available side. Yeah. Okay, what have you got, Brother Dustin? Sorry to shut you down. It took you to the same thing. All right. But but here's my point. It's it's not really hard to find that, is it? Since everybody typed it on the smart. So he's having his church. Google what it <laughs> He's having his church Google what it means uh, to uh, to have a, a gay, uh, excuse me, a, th a thumb ring. Now, on occasion, in a Bible study, not in a sermon, I wouldn't dream of doing it in a sermon because our time is important and valuable, and I don't necessarily want people's phones out. In a Bible study, I'll be like, brother, and it's usually Kyle or someone I know is quick on the phone. Kyle, can you look up the Greek of this? If you could look up Elia.com in the Greek concordance and tell me what, what is this? This is the first time I've ever seen a pastor be like, hey, uh, look up what the uh, gay symbols, go, gay signs. This is a gay. What's Which one is the gay thumb? Does that mean he's available or he's taken if he's gay? Which one is it? It's Stephen Anderson's church. You never know what's going to happen smartphone and Google tells you that right away and then after it tells you that there's result after result after result after result confirming that okay so here's a guy who tells dirty jokes about sodomy where's a thumb ring on which is true he had that terrible uh, uh, rear-ended joke in his late night comedy thing which is weird his right finger which means you know, I'm looking for sodomites to hit on me. Okay, and look, you, it, oh, he didn't know that's what it means. Oh, okay, well, wouldn't you figure it out the first time some faggot comes up to you and says, hey, sailor? Wouldn't you then at that point realize that, oh, man. Okay, so Anderson is going off on a typical Anderson rant. This is what he does. This is, this is the shtick here, which I think we should probably take time to stop and think about. And... and let me make a note to come back to it. Um, so here's the thing. I, I don't think Jeff Durbin is gay. Although Anderson says uh, he has spoken to some of his drill sergeants uh, from when he was in the Army for 18 days. Uh, excuse me, Marines for 18 days in 1998 who said he got out of the army on a discharge because he's gay. And, uh, oh, let me read some of these quotations. Because he goes off on Calvinism, Anderson does. It's funny how these Calvinists love all these verses about being chosen, but you guys forgot the part about being chosen to be holy. He didn't choose you to get a tattoo. He didn't choose you to drink beer. He didn't choose you to drink shots of tequila, which is all true. He didn't choose you to be a drug addict. Durbin's not, as far as I know. He didn't choose you to be a derelict. I wouldn't employ that word to Durbin. He didn't choose you to be a, a cross-dresser. He chose you to be holy and blameless, which is actually, that's accurate. He continued, no Calvinist can preach the gospel because the gospel is that Christ died for us according to the scriptures. Who's us? Uh, I couldn't endure one service at Apologia. <laughs> this is my favorite one. I couldn't endure one service at that Apologia tattoo parlor, beer house, brothel, whatever the bleep they have going on down there. Well, God didn't call you to have a potty mouth either, man. I'm, and finally, he says, I just wish I could press a button and get these Calvinists to stop drinking and tattooing and mutilating their bodies. Now, it's at this point I go, I agree with that. I don't know about the super secret meaning of a thumb ring. I'm not positive as to whether or not that means you're gay. I don't really think so much that that Durbin's uh, seizure was dem demonically induced, okay? I had a guy in our church, uh, John Kim, Korean guy, lived downstairs and was my pastoral assistant for a while because I'm racist. And so he had, he had a seizure and almost died. I didn't think for a moment, I wasn't like, well, that's probably demon possession. That's not actually what came into my head. So I agree, I agree though with the first comment. I just wish I could press a button and get these Calvinists to stop drinking and tattooing themselves and mutilating their bodies. Now, what button do I have to push to get their women out of pants and dress, 
dressed like women in skirts and dresses. Now here I'm lost immediately. I, I can't be on the same bus as Steven Anderson anymore because uh, uh, my wife wears pants and they're feminine. If a guy wore her pants, you'd be like, why are you wearing ladies pants? Uh, it's amazing how they're predestined to look like tramps. Okay, going down the rabbit hole of Steven Anderson's head. Uh, it's amazing how they're predestined to look like white trash. It's amazing how they're predestined to be drunk or to be pierced and tattooed to high heaven. Where's your repentance? You quote, drunken, tattooed, and cannibal-looking <laughs> cannibal looking freak. Uh, at which point all of God's people said, how do you really feel, though, <laughs> Stephen? So uh, in response, now keep in mind, this is a man whose most famous sermon is he who, quote, pisseth against the wall, all right? That's how I know Stephen Anderson from that sermon. That probably has more views than anything he's done. If not, it's certainly most renowned. This is a guy whose second most well-known thing he did is get tased by the border guards. He was right in that situation, by the way, but still, it's hilarious to watch. This um, would be chalked up to crazy preacher says crazy things about another guy. James White takes it to a whole nother level. Uh, it's going to get him some Facebook and Twitter love real fast by hundreds of followers. That Stephen Anderson is awful. He really bad. Stephen Anderson so bad. We already knew he was bad to begin with. We knew he was crazy to begin with. I had him on this show just to demonstrate how crazy he is. It was like exhibit A. Look how crazy this is. Now, I can't log into my, uh, or I can log into my Jordan Hall Facebook account, but I'm still banned for thought crimes because I said uh, uh, a certain Olympian athlete whose name uh, rhymes with Schmoose Schminner was a man and not a woman. I don't want to be banned from my Gideon Knox account, which is the name of my, uh, my LLC. Uh, but I can I can still see messages. I just can't respond to them. And I got a message from someone saying, "I can't believe you're friends with Steven Anderson." It's just so I can I can be like, "Look at this crazy!" Like I'm admitting, we're all admit. We know. Is there anyone out there who doesn't know Steven Anderson? It's a little bit or a lot crazy. Any? No. Okay. All right. So what you've done is you've now taken the crazy and you've. You've thrown it off of YouTube, onto your Facebook, and everywhere else now, which doesn't necessarily seem like the best thing to do. Hey, take a page out of the book of Russell Moore and Moeller or Dever. They think I'm crazy. They act like I don't, I don't exist. That's the smartest thing for them to do. When they begin to attack, like Clayton Jennings, Greg Locke, these guys are amateurs. Uh, it's game over. Like, they got to tap out real fast. It's really the smartest thing to do is just ignore people like that. So um, James White goes after the slander of, uh, of Jeff Durbin on behalf or on the part of uh, Stephen Anderson. And he says, slander, blasphemia in Greek, uh, is one of the sins Christians are commanded to put away along with uh, anger, wrath, malice, and abusive speech. But slander is a daily milieu of some men who actually claim to be Christians. Stephen Anderson, the lead abuser of the poor souls trapped in the Faithful Word Baptist Church. Now, I'm going to stop here and say, I've been to Faithful Word Baptist Church. No one was trapped. I saw one guy in the back who I'm pretty sure was working security in plain clothes. I have that in my church, too. Every good church has somebody garden the place with their back against the wall. But I, I came and went freely. No one is trapped. We have to deal with this issue with Steven Anderson, folks. As a matter of fact, I might spend my time just focusing on this today. Uh, why do people listen to Steven Anderson? I might spend my time here. That would be a good idea. No one is trapped at Faithful Word Baptist Church. No one. They can come and they can go freely. He says he is a man, James, speaking of, uh, or Dr. White, speaking of uh, Stephen Anderson, is a man who is displaying for the whole world to see the path one takes as you desperately try to build your little kingdom and hold on to the power you have built up over other people. Now, I would guess Stephen Anderson, in terms of his little kingdom, 
has more views on YouTube than James White, and his church is probably eight times larger than the one James White just left, if my math is right. That's about right. Uh, and it's probably eight times larger on a Wednesday than Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church is on a Sunday morning. So I'm not sure that it's a little kingdom if we're talking comparisons. He says, the path one takes is you desperately tr oh, yeah, try to build your little kingdom. Uh, but I repeat myself. Given the fundamental denials of gospel truths inherent in his beliefs, such as cultic King James onlyism, let me stop here for a moment. Can I scroll through the comments in my live feed? I can. Let me ask a question. What makes King James only as an occult? Honest question. Okay, I get they're weird. And some of them, like Ruckman, believe in delayed revelation. If King James onlyism is a cult, is King James preferredism a cult? I'm concerned as a polemicist that we're throwing around the word cult a little too willy-nilly. I, I would like someone to explain why King James onlyism is a cult in the same way as Mormonism is a cult. Send me an email, jd at polemicsreport.com. Maybe you can teach me something I don't already know. Um, <clears throat> a rabid denial of the centrality of repentance. I don't know what that means. A rejection. I mean, I do, but I don't know how it applies to Anderson. Um, I guess I guess because Anderson is easy believism. I guess that's it probably, a re, which is problematic. Rejection of the lordship of Christ and salvation. Same thing. Um, yeah, easy believism. A detestation of the biblical doctrines of grace. It's true. He's a flaming Arminian maybe a Pelagian, combined with the who cares about history attitude that marks so much of IFBism. Here's what I want to demonstrate. Anderson is saying, all you Calvinists are a bunch of, hold on a second, what did he say exactly? I, I, I was going to say I literally couldn't put it better, but I, that's probably an insult to myself, not a compliment. Um, he says, I couldn't endure one service at that Apologia tattoo parlor, beer house, brothel, whatever the bleep they have going on down there. So he is characterizing Calvinists as beer guzzling, tattooing, debauched uh, revelers. And I would say, I'm not. I don't have a tattoo because my mother taught me not to draw on myself. I don't think it's necessarily a sin, but I don't think that it screams maturity and sober-mindedness either. I, I, I wouldn't be opposed to getting a tattoo uh, if you could demonstrate why you need one. And so I guess that's why we call it a Christian liberty, right? Like, but that it's a Christian liberty means it can be debated. We can talk about the wisdom of such things, whether or not they should be done. But what you're describing regarding Jeff Durbin doesn't fit me. I'm not a new Calvinist. I'm a get off my lawn Calvinist. I'm an old school uh, Calvinist. I, I we're not all that way, Stephen Anderson. And and here is what I noticed about uh, Dr. White. He is impugning, although to be fair, he doesn't say all, but much of IFBism. Is it really? Is much of IFBism like this? I tell you what, fundamental Baptist churches are thriving in America. In every town, you'll find dying Southern Baptist churches that are trying to be Elevation Church, even though they only have 20 people and they're all over 70. They got some young pastor who's, you know, changes the name from First Baptist Church of Jonestown to uh, Celebration Church of the Lakeland, Lakeland Woods or some you know, weird name like that. Uh, the Rock sounds like a, you know, a professional arrest, The Crossing. Uh, 
sounds like either a horror movie or a professional wrestler, these church names. They put lipstick on the pig and renamed the old church. And these churches are they're crumbling. They're dying. They've lost their foundation. The independent fundamental Baptist churches are doing pretty well. They're trucking along. Uh, they're doing fine. And there are a lot of towns where one of the largest churches that still preach the gospel are the IFB churches. Here's the thing, though. I don't think most people are seeing. They don't have big websites. They don't have huge conferences because they keep it mostly within the local church. They are independent, after all. And they're sure as heck not going to Together for the Gospel or some, something like that. They're, uh, they're keeping it low-key, but they're baptizing believers. They're making disciples. They're leading people to Christ, legitimately so. Um, they're not, most of them, teaching that you know the Trinity is Father, Son, and, and King James Bible. You just don't see them or notice them. They're not on Facebook. They're not on Twitter because they're against modernity. But they're out there. And most of them are nothing like Anderson. Anderson then points out that uh, the word blasphemia is uh, typically used in speaking with God uh, or or about God. And uh, White then pointed out, going back and forth on Facebook, you remember, be careful when you argue argue with the fool because it will be hard for people to tell the twain apart. Uh, White then schools him in Greek and explains that that term is often used for others besides God, including even Satan at one point, which White is accurate on that, that specific point. So we reached out to Durbin for clarification regarding his military discharge and uh, no response. And then we got... Uh, the discharge paper, uh, the DR, uh, what is it, DR-214, uh, or DD-214, stands for Department of Defense 214, from 1998, showing that Durbin uh, was discharged from active duty after 14, uh, 18 days in the service. And it doesn't say why, and we thought, well, why isn't there a reason for discharge or a status of discharge um, on the DD-214? Because I've seen several of those for for veterans. Um, I've I've seen them in helping families put together stuff uh, for their departed loved ones. And I thought it was odd, too. So I asked my dad. My dad is the chief uh, or was the chief of training separation for uh, the Army and Air Force and served, um, it's a civilian role, by the way, back in uh, 2000, uh, excuse me, 1998. And according to my dad, if you've served less than 60 days, uh, there is no status status for your, for your discharge. There's, there's no status for, uh, for the discharge. Um, however, Heather Hudson commented on the post, you can leave comments at pulpit and pin, by the way, and says, uh, why is it this from the uh, quotation from Durbin? Why is this left out of the article? And the answer is, didn't know it. So I'm glad you left a, a comment. I was administratively, he says, Durbin discharged after a couple of weeks in boot camp because my testimony to the chaplain about severe abuses led to my life and several others being put in danger. They begged me to stay after an official investigation. I chose to leave after it was obvious that my life was in danger. Several Marine instructors were threatening my life. I had to be put under protection. Now, I've read this to several people in the Marines, and they're like, you, you, if you're listening, not watching, I'm shaking my head. And they're like going, no, <laughs> no, didn't happen. Several Marine drill instructors were threatening my life. I had to be put under protection. They had an official investigation. They halted the police training. Several men tried to escape. Some tried to kill themselves. So he's explaining that this is a full metal jacket type situation. I own pop culture reference, my bad. I almost stayed. However, uh, when they were giving me time to decide, three Marine drill instructors threatened my life. Again, at the mess hall, the commander of the base was asking me to give them another chance in a new platoon. After the last threat on my life, he and I agreed it was no longer safe and I should leave. Uh, And it was an administrative discharge. So you might ask yourself the question, how does Steven Anderson wind up with the discharge paper? And Durbin's going to want to listen to this. So send this to Durbin. Uh, Tag him. I think I know. How does Anderson wind up with the discharge paperwork 
for Durban. Well, a few years ago, maybe it was at the height of the beer and tattoo uh, fundraisers scandal. Uh, I got a call from a relative of Durban's giving me all the backstory. And I said, I can't listen to this accusation because he's another pastor. And Paul spoke to Timothy about this and said, you actually need an extra witness, one more witness to consider the accusation uh, than uh, with just a regular church member. So I need two or three, not one or two witnesses to substantiate this and encourage him to go to, uh, what's that guy's name? Whale? B Bear? I don't know. The, the co-host, the sidekick. Everybody needs a sidekick. Like Joe Thorne has Jimmy. And Durbin has, what's his name with the piercings? What I need is a big, hairy, this big, like, I'm trying to be nice, this big guy. I need to be somebody's sidekick, I think is what I'm saying. And then, like, fall into a tackle box and uh, look like, you know, I've got hooks and gadgets sticking out of my face. I, I need, like, I can be a sidekick. I, there's probably an opening somewhere. I could be somebody's sidekick. I said, contact the sidekick. They're an elder-led church. They can deal with this. Um, but I turned down the evidences that they were wanting to send me about Durban um, for that reason. Like, I've got no business looking at this. I can guarantee you it was that family member that got a hold of me, and I rejected that information. Jeff Durbin, you know who I'm talking about. Pretty sure that's where Anderson got it if i had to wager now does any of this make a difference not really why because durbin has an impressive testimony he was a like a crackhead or a he was on hallucinogenic drugs or something i don't know he was on he was like an addict and at some point i don't know he was a jujitsu master I, I don't know this the sequence at some point god apparently saved the man so what is past is past, so long as he's not now lying about it. Thumb rings aside. You see, here's the difference between myself and Anderson. I believe that homosexuals can get saved and then leave all of their, um, uh, leave, leave all of their proclivities and their former nature behind. Because those God saves, he saves indeed. And I don't see a limp wrist with Durbin. I don't, I don't see it. So what if he was gay? Does any of that matter? No. But in the meantime, you have these two parties in Phoenix. Feel sorry for the city of Phoenix going after each other like this. If someone is insane, like Servetus Christi, just ignore them as best you can. That will be to your advantage as opposed to dragging this out. And now, you know, the press is uh is talking about it uh by the way my father said a a base commander is not going to have communications with a green recruit period b if a chaplain repeats what he said he's been he's violated his code of ethics he's never seen that happen c a drill sergeant is a professional soldier and would not do such a thing it's an insult to the military he said he, he's never seen a drill sergeant do something like that ever and again my uh, my dad, did I say this, was the chief of training separations. His job was to kick people out of the military uh, for the Department of Defense and the Armed Services, including those claiming to be gay so that they can get discharged. Who cares? Does it matter at this point? No. Now, here's a different question. Let me transition. Why is anyone, for the love of all that is good and pure, listening to Stephen Anderson? I mean, especially people that are relatively normal or they seem normal, they seem normal enough. Like when you, when you go in again, they seem like they're not insanely idiotic. And by the way, it's not a bunch of, of, of uh, poor people at Stephen Anderson's church. I thought it would probably be a bunch of people that they were bussing in from the inner city with hot dogs and candy. That's not what it was. They don't even do buses at Faithful Word Baptist Church. I thought it would be poor people. It's not. These were middle class to upper middle class people. Uh, I thought that it would be, 
a bunch of people with kind of drool going down their chin like, I don't know about the book learning. They were reasonably intelligent people. Yeah, I'm sure that most of them were homeschoolers. But it, homeschoolers, there are some bad ones, but I mean, most of them are reasonably intelligent folk. I, I don't know if Anderson has ever said anything racist, but there's a bit of me that just kind of suspected, <laughs> you know, like, why not? It, throw everything, throw everything else in there. Um, and his church is like, I'm guessing a third African American. It's got more, I tell you what, I bet Stephen Anderson's church in Tempe, Arizona has a more diverse ethnic uh makeup than Tim Keller's Redeemer Presbyterian in New York. Well, he left that church or he's no longer the pastor. I bet Stephen Anderson's church has more ethnic diversity than 95% of the Southern Baptists, like David Platt, like when David Platt st stands up at Together for the Gospel and says, why are there so much white people in here? Actually, that's not his voice. Why are there so many white faces in the crowd? That's the snowflake voice. Why are there so many white people here? Why aren't there enough black? Why aren't there more black people? Um, I'm willing to bet Stephen Anderson has more black people in his church in a percentage basis than um, than than David Platt has. I didn't expect any of that. Why why are they here? And I think a lot of them, and I've spoken to a few, like in Facebook Messenger, I'm like, you realize that your pastor's uh, crazy. Like I have this relationship where Stephen, with Stephen, where when he was on the program, I said, you know, like, I don't consider you a Christian, right? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I don't consider you one either. Okay, well, now that's out of the way. Um, I, we'll, we'll just anathematize each other and have a... Why? I want to get to the bottom of it. Why is Stephen Anderson, quote-unquote, uh, successful? He is. He started the church 12 years ago. It's doing very well. And he's got a worldwide ministry, uh, as real as Dr. White's. Why? And I, here's why I think it is. In spite of a lot of his church knowing maybe he's not the best preacher, maybe he doesn't know exposition, maybe he hates Calvinists to a bizarre level, I think it is that rare today to find men who preach boldly what they think truth is. And there are ditches on both sides of the road. Cowardice is on one side of the road. That's one ditch. And the other ditch is Stephen Anderson, where he's standing on his pulpit saying idiotic things. So I'm not saying that I'm commending what he says. But I guarantee you Stephen Anderson would die for who he thinks Jesus is. There's no doubt of that. There's no doubt in the minds of his congregation that he's not a cream puff who's going to compromise on what he thinks truth is. Unfortunately, his doctrine is abysmal. Unfortunately. But let it be a lesson to the rest of us. The fact that there's anyone listening to Stephen Anderson demonstrates people are eager and hungry for men they believe to be men of God. I'm not saying Anderson is, but men they believe to be men of God who will Ian Paisley that pulpit, who will stand behind it or in Anderson's case, even on top of it, it doesn't matter, and and say bold things, come hell or high water. I mean, call me hateful. I don't care. Call me a bigot. I don't care. Have the Southern Poverty Law Center come after me. I don't care. Make it on Right Wing Launch. I don't care. Do you have any idea how appealing manhood is to people today? Authentic Manhood, even crazy manhood, but like it may be, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get tased by the border guard over sticking to constitutional principles. People want that. Now, if you're listening to the sound of my voice, I'm not saying go to Stephen Anderson's church. Don't do that. I'm not saying go to a church with terrible doctrine because the pastor plays the man. I'm not. 
As a matter of fact, I'm just telling you, you may have to deal with a wussy pastor whose doctrine isn't awful. That is uh, better than the alternative, which is going to a, a bold preacher whose doctrine is, is horrible. I just want to speak to the pastors and say, don't be afraid of being bold. The sissified churches are all dying. I'm convinced that what is considered the radical and fringe by most people today, Stephen Anderson aside, let me talk about just Calvinism in general. Um, I'm convinced that the men today that we call divisive and horrible and terrible um, I'm convinced that they will one day be looked at far more fondly and history will judge them better than their contemporaries. Because we've seen it time and time again, not just with Spurgeon, but with so many other downgrade issues, the men that are willing to stand up and speak the truth, especially when it is truth, again, not what Anderson's doing, but authentic truth are hated despised by their contemporaries and especially by men who ought to be their colleagues. Um, but the next generation looks back and says, yeah, so they were right. Jay Gresham Mockin on liberalism and social religion. Am I pronouncing that name correctly? It's the book that you're going to get if you're a Patreon supporter and uh, somebody post that Patreon link, if you would, an admin or something. Um, and if you, uh, if you join uh, as a Patreon supporter before January 1st, you'll get this book. Um, he was uh, pivotal in the formation of the Independent Board of, for Presbyterian Foreign Missions, the PCA, and also the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Let me read to you just a few of his quotations on liberalism. Now tell me if this isn't, like, relevant for today. The older evangelism, says the modern liberal preacher, sought to rescue individuals, while the newer evangelism seeks to transform the whole organism of society. The old evangelism was individual. The new evangelism is social. Isn't that the truth? Back in the day, we used to want to, you know, evangelize individuals. Now it's all about the social order. Well, what kind of gospel is it if it doesn't change society? Are you saying it doesn't change society? No, I'm saying I don't give two flame of pennies whether or not it changes society because Jesus is going to burn society to the ground along with culture and art and entertainment and music. He's going to roll it up like a garment, according to Hebrews 1. So I don't care about any of that. No, Jesus came to redeem souls, sinners, individuals of their sin. The new liberalism or new evangelism, which is old liberalism, says that evangelism is social. Here's the next quotation. The greatest menace to the Christian church today comes not from enemies outside, but from the enemies within. Of course, you've heard me say that a million times. Um, it comes from the presence within the church of a type of faith and practice that is anti-Christian to the core. And he's talking about liberalism. He says, but one thing is perfectly plain. Whether or not liberals are Christians, listen to this. You guys are all conservative. Why are you so conservative? Conservatism like, is not Christianity, but Christians should be conservative. He says, whether or not liberals are Christians, it is at any rate perfectly clear that liberalism is not Christianity. And that being the case, it is highly undesirable that liberalism and Christianity should continue to be propagated within the boundaries of the same organization. A separation between the two parties in the church is, is the crying need of the hour. He died in 1918. This is still relevant today. Is it not the need of the hour that liberalism be separated from the church? He says, the plain fact is that liberalism, whether it's true or false, is no mere heresy, no mere divergence at isolated points from Christian teaching. On the contrary, it proceeds from a totally different route, and it constitutes, in essentials, a unitary system of its own. Christianity is being attacked from within by a movement which is anti-Christian. Now, what about separation, separating from liberals? What about, what about Shepherd's Conference and G3, where John MacArthur says this is the greatest polemical battle of our, life, of our lifetime, and then he invited the key proponents of social justice 
to his church to preach at Shepcon. At what point do we separate? Now, this is the question that Spurgeon asked in the downgrade. This is the question he asked. At what point should we separate? And if my system was working correctly, I'd have a video on the screen behind me of Todd Friel's stupid, I love Todd, but that's a, the video where he's drawing circles. Have you seen it? If, you, if not, uh, listen to the Bible Thumping Wingnut episode um, on circles and lines, lines and circles, where this is discussed. The Dallas statement, like the Chicago statement, like ECT, evangel evangelicals and Catholics together, was a line in the sand. With, Chica with the Chicago statement, if, if you couldn't affirm it, you're out of the club. We'll kick you out of our seminaries. Man, we'll be done with you. We'll kick you out of our churches. If you can't affirm the Bible's inerrancy, peace out. Not even peace out. Conflict out. Like this, no, no rest, no retreat. This is war. With the ECT, it was the opposite for our side. If you sign the ECT, Chuck Colson, Packer, we're done with you. To the point that if you got stuff from J.I. Packer, from uh, um, Banner of Truth, uh, or from Chapel Library, there's a disclaimer on it. Like, we're not necessarily endorsing J.I. Packer. Like, you get an asterisk by your name for the rest of time. If we could chisel an asterisk into the J.I. Packer's tombstone, we would. Because you don't claim that Roman Catholics are Christians. That statement was a line in the sand. And if the Dallas statement wasn't made to be a line in the sand, it was worthless. And you know what? When I wrote the post, which when you Google, it's the top news article that comes up about the Dallas statement. The only Google link higher than pulpit and pen about the Dallas statement is the Dallas statement. The second most well-read link at the top of Google search results is my post, a line in the sand, where I said, this is a line in the sand. And you know what? I wasn't corrected by Phil Johnson. I wasn't corrected by Michael O'Fallon. I wasn't corrected by Tom Buck. I wasn't corrected by Justin Peters. I wasn't corrected by all the guys I personally talked to on the phone about this statement. As a matter of fact, without naming names, a lot of them said, great article. They agreed it was a line in the sand. The next thing I know, and I understand the video from Todd was three months ago, but Phil just posted it on his YouTube page. Next thing I know, we're talking about drawing circles, where on one hand, way over here, you've got white supremacists, really? And over here, you have Marxists at number five? Excuse me, no. Marxists, I'm, I'm just going to have to break down that video, aren't I? Marxists aren't at number five. The moment you think that someone is poor because of systemic uh, oppression, and you're talking proletariat and bourgeois language, then you're Marxist. I would be fine with Todd's video if everything on the left side of that line, which is right, because they're leftists and they belong on the left side of the line. Thank you. I would be fine if the, everyone on the left side of the line, we said that's five levels of Marxism, not leftism. Everyone on that side of the line is a tinge Marxist. That's the ideology that undergirds it. And in me saying that, with all of the Dallas Statement signers, like nine of the 13 I've personally known and talked to about this, everyone said, this is a line, this is a line, this is a line. And now all of a sudden we're saying, well, we can, but, but we can hope to talk to Dever and Moeller and Duncan and H.B. Charles, who I understand has an honorary degree from, Shep, from, from Masters, but give me a break. He's as bad as Tabidi Anabwile. Beth Moore is tweeting her social justice garbage, and, and RTS is liking it. Um, the most insanely idiotic critical race theories that are propagated on Twitter, League and Duncan is liking it. Tabidi Anabwile was talking about uh, tweeting white history. No more white history. He's going to tweet black history for the next year. And he throws out and he says, oh, and by the way, Legan Duncan liked that tweet. And he said he's going to learn from Mark Dever, except instead of tweeting history, it's going to be black history. And Dever's like, I'm so proud of you, man. Okay, so you're having 
the like critical race theory anybody that's not a one todd <laughs> i love todd i love todd so much that's not a one on the marxist scale todd that's a five on cultural marxism that's not a okay so you're going to have these guys come you shouldn't have done the dallas statement at all and the same goes for g3 and josh buys and Dever there as well. If you're going to draw a line in the sand, draw a line in the sand. What would be the harm of saying, you know, Al, you know, Mark, you know, Legan, until we get this resolved, we're going to go a different direction with the conference. Now you got to have HB Charles there because he's, you know, he's a black guy and you need a black guy to come speak. His theology is crap, total crap. Um, his his political philosophy is, again, as bad as to beating a relay. Um, you've got all of these guys in, involved in promoting the MLK 50 conference, taking part in the racialism at Together for the Gospel. Tabidi wouldn't be invited to ShepCon. You cannot distinguish Tabidi from Mark Deber. You cannot distinguish Russell Moore from Albert Moeller. Do you, I mean, I would debate anyone on that topic. I've got the information in my head. Go look at pulpit and pen. It doesn't matter if it was the breaking bread with gays where he literally broke bread with Matthew Vines and Justin Lee at the Gay Christian Network. Um, and, and I mean, Moeller was there. He's been there with Moore every single step of the way, liking every uh, every tweet, promoting every conference, writing the forward in every book, backslapping on social media, constantly pushing his material, promoting his material. Oh, and the the argument from some with MacArthur saying, "Well, you, it's really hard to make an argument from silence." Mueller hasn't been silent. He's been Russell Moore's biggest cheerleader. Moore is encouraging Southern trustees to name Southern Chapel after Mueller, while Mueller is calling Russell Moore the greatest Southern Baptist leader in the last 30 years. You're insulting my intelligence and the intelligence of anyone who's halfway discerning. Uh, I did a post... Uh, about the one where Fred Butler was wrong. Now, nobody knows who Fred Butler is. I mean, people in Twitter and stuff know who Fred is. Fred's a really great guy. I texted him on his birthday this year. I'm like, happy birthday, Fred. I I love Fred. But what Fred said on the Bible flipping we know regarding this issue, which again is should be one of separation, godly separation, is uh, it will give them a chance to talk about the issue. They've had four months to talk about the issue. They've had four months. Moeller is the only one who said anything about it. He said certain parts of it were problematic. He didn't specify which parts. Uh, and then said it would uh, cause fruitful dialogue, but then said nothing for four months. Devers acted like it doesn't exist. Duncan exists, uh, again, acts like it doesn't exist. Again, it's insulting our intelligence to act as though in order to have a conversation with Duncan, Dever, and Moeller to try to talk sense into them, you're going to invite them to come preach? I thought you were good friends. Why can't you pick up the phone and call? I got an email from who seems to be a very lovely lady who says, you know, I read your website and I'm also a big fan of Dr. MacArthur. I think what I think what MacArthur is doing is he's going to have these guys debate, essentially, like he's going to debate them. He's going to put them on. <laughs> if Dr. MacArthur would have said, hey, Al, hey, Mark, hey, Legan, when you're here, we want to put you on the spot about what you really believe about social justice, not a single one of the, those men would come. Now somebody, somebody at, at, you know, in MacArthur's camp, tell me I'm wrong. Tell me you think any of those guys would be like, yeah, I want to give some straightforward, non-nuanced, 
nuanced, clear answers on what I believe regarding social justice. They wouldn't even darken the doorway of Shepherd's Conference. They're not going to do it. They've had all the opportunity in the world to do it. As a matter of fact, that sweet lady brought up uh, EIT and said, you know, you've got Sproul and MacArthur trying to talk sense into Chuck Colson and and, and D, uh, uh, D. James Kennedy was there. He was on the right side as well, trying to talk sense into uh, Colson and Packer. Right. But the statement was a line. Did you see Colson then be promoted by grace to you after that or by league and air Packer? No, I saw him skewered by MacArthur and Sproul. Not invited to come preach. So either this is the most important political battle of our lifetime, or it's, not you got to pick one on separating from liberals he said many indeed are seeking to avoid the separation why they say may not brethren dwell together in unity the church we're told has room for both liberals and conservatives the conservatives may be allowed to remain if they will keep trifling matters in the background and attend chiefly to the weightier matters of the law and among the things thus designated as trifling is found the cross of christ and vicarious atonement for sins he says what we're fighting about is not trifling now, again, focus. We're talking about what is the gospel and what is not. If you don't preach social change, are you not preaching the full gospel? Because that's the claim made by Tim Keller. That's the claim made by Russell Moore. That's the claim made by Tabidi Anabwile and Al Mohler's liking the tweet. That's the claim made by Beth Moore. That's the claim made by the social justice warriors that it's not the full gospel. Are you telling me the gospel's not at stake here? Because one thing is for sure, when Fred Butler, who I love, like Phil and Todd, who I love, I'm pretty sure I'm on their, I'm, I didn't even get coal for, Chris, for uh, Christmas from those guys, so I'm sure I'm probably off the list. Um, I like you anymore, but I don't have enough time for soap operas in my life, don't care. And I, I, but I do genuinely love them and nothing will change. But when they, when they argue that we're inviting these men to come preach because social justice isn't a gospel issue. It falls flat as an argument when those men say social justice is a gospel issue. Can I get an amen? From anybody? Anybody? Moeller says it's a gospel issue. Dever says it's a gospel issue. Duncan says it's a gospel issue. But MacArthur invites them to come preach at ShepCon because, or at least his associates, loose associates, no, fans are saying, I don't want to say they're associates, because at least his fans are saying, well, it's not like it's a, it's not like it's a gospel issue. According to Mueller, it's a gospel issue. So, yeah, yeah it, it seems like it's a, it's a gospel issue. Is JD attending G3? I just, I forget there's comments. I'll go through these in just a second. Um, uh, no, I'm listen, here's where I'm at with conferences. I'm not doing it unless it's for a local church or with a local church. So no. The liberal preacher says to the conservative party in the church. Now I don't want to read that one. How about this one? The separation of naturalistic liberalism from the evangelical churches would no doubt greatly diminish the size of the churches. In other words, he says if liberalism left, it would decrease the size of the churches. But Gideon's 300 were more powerful than 32,000 with which the march against the Midianites began. If I could trade my church of 100 people on a good Sunday for a church of 300 Kyle J. Howards, I would keep my church. Or 1,000 Kyle J. Which, which is Jose? Which is worse? One Kyle J. Howard or 1,000? No, see, that because that formula doesn't work. Because the more Kyle J. Howards, the worse it is. I... I would rather have a church of a hundred discerning, loving, giving, serving people and, and be told, all right, now go preach the gospel and make disciples in Richland County, Montana, than to be handed a church of 500 Southern seminary grads who don't know what's wrong with Stephen Furtick. Is he really that bad? Is Andy Stanley really that bad? I mean, Andy Stanley reaches the, just get, you can leave my church. <laughs> 
I'll open the door. We'll give you curbside service. Like we'll open the doors. I'll start the car for you. Yeah, it'll make the church shrink. Do you want that around? Subversive liberals seek a place in the ministry that they may teach what is directly contrary to the confession of faith to which they subscribe. Now, if if he's not talking about Tim Keller, who's he talking about? It obviously wasn't Keller because Keller wasn't alive yet, but subversive liberals seek a place in the ministry that they may teach what is directly contrary to the confession of faith to which they subscribe. For that course of action, various excuses are made. If a man desires to combat the message instead of propagating it, he has no right, no matter how false the message may be, to gain a vantage point, uh, excuse me, vantage ground for combating it by making a declaration of his faith, which be it plainly spoken is not true. In other words, if you don't fully adhere to what the confession is, get out. This deal that happened last week at uh, Southwest Baptist University, and by the way, I think that uh, the trustees at the Missouri Baptist Convention, if they don't speak up, you're cowards, and uh, that's where I stand, related or not. And the trustees at Southwest Baptist University, shame on you, but the trustees of the Missouri Convention need to stand up. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, the dean, Eric Turner at Southwest Baptist University, fired Dr. Bass for questioning uh, another individual by the name of, of Dr. Reeves. Um, excuse me, he's the, he's the dean, Eric Turner is the president. Bass questioned the teaching of Dr. Reeves, who very clearly was teaching universalism and inclusion, inclusivism, very clearly, on audio, with timestamps and quotations and a transcript. Like, Nailed to the wall, the dude is teaching inclusivism and annihilationism, where he uses those words. The guy who is trying to investigate and figure out what he believes, they demand to see his personal diary, which is Machiavellian. I mean, it's, it's, it's Bolshevik type stuff. And then they fire him for threatening the integrity of the institution. Not the heretic. Not Dr. Reeves, who was at my alma mater, Williams Baptist College. And so is Eric Turner, by the way. Small world, I guess. They fired the guy concerned about the heretic. And the Baptist faith and message doesn't teach annihilationism, but that, uh, or inclusivism for that matter. Why is he teaching at a Southern Baptist school? Here's why. It's because liberals subversive liberals seek a place in the ministry that they may teach what is directly contrary to the confession of faith to which they subscribe. So there's a politics term called website orthodoxy. Just because you say, I, I hold the Southern Baptist faith and message. I believe in it. No, you don't. No, we deal with this all the time as Reformed Baptists because you get people who are tatting 1689 on their knuckles and they're like, well, I don't strictly adhere to it. So, <laughs> so you, what you're saying is you don't adhere to it. But with the Southern Baptist faith and message, you ought to have to hold to that to have a job. You're supposed to, to have a job. Here's the dean of the, of the college. He's an inclusivist. He thinks you can go to heaven without faith in Jesus. This is how liberals work. Now, again, this is from the turn of the century. He's writing this. On polemics. He says, they should not say in the sense in which some laymen say it, that more time should be devoted. And this is, I think, what made me think of it. Listen to this quotation. They shouldn't say in the sense in which some laymen say it, that more time should be devoted to the propagation of Christianity and less time to the defense of Christianity. In other words, people are like, why do you always got to talk about what you're against? Talk about what you're for. He's talking about that guy. We shouldn't say that more time should be devoted to the propagation of Christianity and less to the defense of it. What they really intend is the discouragement of the whole intellectual defense of the faith. No, what you want is for the faith not to be defended at all. And their words, and this line about made me cry. I almost got a little, I mean, I don't have tears, but I almost, a little bit of salt came out of my eye. Listen to this line. 
their words come as a blow in the face of those who are fighting the great battle. So here we are, down in the trenches, dealing with this social justice thing years ago. Telling you this is a problem. Warning you about Russell Moore. Warning you about Albert Moeller. Warning you about Duncan. Warning you about Dun uh, about Dever and Tabidi Anabwile. And it's not like MacArthur's camp hasn't noticed Tabidi Anabwile with the whole Phil Johnson mission drift thing. You clearly know these men are problematic. So here we are, pulpit and pen and polemicists and discernment folks and just decent God-fearing Christians that are conservatives and not compromisers. We're down here getting the slobber knocked out of us in social media every day of the week, getting the daylights pummeled out of, pummeled out of us in our churches to fight this. And then you invite these men to come preach. Yes, it feels like stabbed in the back. That's what it feels like. Yes. We thought we were following you. I thought I was following Phil this whole time, or John, Dr. MacArthur, or Justin, or these guys that have been silent. I thought I was following their lead. Apparently, we weren't on the same page this whole time. Who knew? I mean, after all, it's not like it's the most significant polemical battle of our day or anything. But these men say, no, don't separate, don't separate. And it comes as a blow in the face of those who are fighting the great battle. As a matter of fact, not less time, but more time should be devoted to the defense of the gospel, he says. More time should be devoted to the defense of the gospel. We should contend for the truth as it was earnestly given to the saints. And that word contend means to grapple, to fight, to wrestle. Wrestle for that which is true by fighting that which is false. He said, indeed, truth cannot be stated clearly at all without being set over against error. Now, this is the problem with the Dallas statement is, as they said at the time, who are they talking about? This isn't a problem. This is a straw man. They should name names. It was unclear. And I thought it was kind of unclear. I mean, they could have, but I think we all know who we're talking about. That's what I said. I mean, the Dallas statement was unclear. That's one thing the critics all said is, it, who are you talking about? all coy. And I'm going, I think we all know who we're talking about. We're talking about Mueller. We're talking about Dever. We're talking about Duncan. Well, if you can't clearly say what you're against and name names in the process, this is pointless. This is a pointless fight. Is Kyle J. How well, okay, we... Kyle J. Howard, he's a cartoon. We know that he's uh, nuts. Uh, Tabidi, no, we can't say that because he writes for Gospel Coalition. We can't call him a commie, race-baiting, white-hating, uh, horrible human being, black nationalist. We can't call him that. Who's fine with killing babies and abortion so long as a Democrat's in office. We can't say that. We certainly can't say anything against the Lord's anointed like Moeller. Well, let's just quit then. Let's quit. By that, I mean polemics, discernment. What Todd does, Todd Frill, he should just quit. Do comedy, go back to comedy. Strange fire there. Why can't we? treat the social justice warriors the same way that we treat the charismatics. After all, social justice is the greatest polemical battle of our time. Not charismaticism. That's according to Dr. MacArthur. I mean, are we really saying Michael Brown's not a brother in Christ? Yeah, I don't include false prophets in that category. But uh, what about Chandler? Am I saying Chandler's not a brother in Christ? I'm saying he is greatly confused. I'm not anathematizing Matt Chandler, but like the whole a guy sneezed on me and I got my anointing stuff. 
that's dark and weird. So, no, you can't preach at my conference. Why wouldn't you do that with Moeller or Duncan or Dever? In this case, I'm not arguing, and this is something else that frustrated me about Fred's podcast with the Bible Thumping Wingnut guys. He talked about Brandon a lot. Uh, I defended MacArthur for years against Brandon House. I was at Worldview Weekend, and I was effectively told to choose between my love for Brandon House and being on Worldview Weekend's network. And I told Worldview Weekend to peace out. All right? Like, see ya. I, I, I didn't attack. I didn't attack MacArthur for the radio broadcasting trade show thing. This is different. Can you not see this is different? Anyways, Machen says, as a matter of fact, not less time, but more time should be devoted to the defense of the gospel. Indeed, truth cannot be stated clearly at all without being set over against error. Thus, a large part of the New Testament is polemic. The enunciation of evangelical truth was occasioned by the errors which had arisen in the churches. And then God has always saved the church, but he, and I love this line, he has, I quoted it in the sermon on Sunday, he has always saved it not by its theological pacifists, but by the sturdy contenders of the truth. Amen and amen. Um disappointed is what I'd say I am since the last time um, I was with you. And sorry, I'm, I mean to do two podcasts a week. It doesn't always happen. I feel like I'm letting my Patreon supporters down when I don't podcast. But um, we had a death in, sh in the church and then some other things. And always, always, always my church is going to come first. Always. And uh, I'm fixing to go to New Mexico for 17 weeks and back and forth and traveling a lot. So trying to get ready for that. Let me go through the comments uh, real quick. Um, I see a lot of comments. How many questions are in here? Social justice, uh, says Josh Fritz, is uh, a form of heresy. Uh, excuse me, a form of liberation theology, which is heresy. No, social justice is liberation theology. That's a good point. In terms of Todd Friel saying, you got the fives over here that are Marxist, but then the fours, the threes, the twos, and the ones aren't Marxist. No, it was all thought up uh, by Gustavo Gutierrez in South America. Um, uh, that, oh, and, and by the, uh, um, the uh, what was his name? The guy who thought up the term proletariat and bourgeois with uh, critical Marxism in, in, uh, in Italy. The, uh, the fascist politician. That's what's undergirding the entire thing. Um, Trevor Cunningham says he couldn't fathom attending a major Southern Baptist seminary these days. Yeah, where would you go? <laughs> Southwestern? No. Which is going to be Southern 2.0 as soon as they replace Patterson. Um, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, where they... Andrew... Uh, Adam Harwood, no. I don't know what's going on with Golden Gates, completely off my radar. Jason Allen's on the social justice train. I, I don't know. Where would you go to seminary? Masters at this point? If you were a dispensationalist, yeah. If you were confessional, I don't know. Covenant Reformed, Reformed Baptist Theological Seminary. Some, some one of the online Reformed Baptist schools, or honestly, I, I mean, I have a friend that just enrolled at Oxford. Um, maybe just find the best liberal school you can go to and get as much out of it as you can. I certainly certainly wouldn't pay extra to go to a denominational school and be a part of the machine because you're going to come out as part of the uh, part of the Borg. Um, nearly every Reformed seminary has allowed liberalism in as well. This is Steve Evans. Yeah. Yep. And it's because Colin Pearson's article came out, Young, Restless, and Reformed, and the George Soros's and the James Riottis looked at the movement and said, let's capture that and use it for political purposes, which is what they've done. Um, Springfield, Missouri, Jeremiah Johnson says, is so full of bad churches, it's not even funny. Go to the pulpit bunker. I am aware of a reform. 
uh, it has uh, either staff people or church members in the pulpit bunker. I forget their name. I've meant to visit, visit them whenever I'm in Springfield, but my brother is a pastor in a suburb of Springfield. So I, I don't often get to now my folks moved off to, uh, to Branson. And so I, I fellowship at a, a regular Baptist church with a, with a good pastor, uh, in, uh, in that town. But there's, there's good churches in Springfield. I'm sure maybe you look a little bit harder. Um, Conservative Reformed Theology. I'm going to hold on a second. You know what I need to do from now on? I need to have the admin send me the good questions so I don't have to uh, scroll through them. Phil Johnson has really stirred up Brandon Howe, said Sylvia Martin Lafferty. Yeah, that's kind of what they do. Those two go back and forth like Anderson and... Uh, A white. I texted Brandon. I'll show this to you. This is funny. I wanted a copy of Marxianity <laughs> just to review it. But it's not on Amazon. You got to get it directly from Brandon. So I texted him, Where do you order? Because remember, he used to call me every day. I was a broadcaster. Where do you order Marxianity? I don't see it on Amazon. And he says, well, where to go? Please don't contact me anymore. <laughs> I don't have any friends. Um, <clears throat> please don't contact me anymore, Brandon said. I just wanted to know where your book is. It's like 15 bucks with $10 shipping. It's 25 bucks, I think. I didn't want to pay that for the dumb book. Uh, and so, yeah, so it aggravates me when someone's like, that's just like what Brandon House would do. The Brandon House says not to contact them anymore because I won't attack James White hard enough for him. That that one. The one that says don't contact him because I I chose MacArthur over him. Yeah, I'm I'm just like Brandon House. Listen, is MacArthur anathema? No. Listen to J Mac. Listen to him. I wouldn't go to ShepCon, but that's up to you. I wouldn't fault you if you did much. But when somebody's right, you give them an attaboy. When somebody's wrong, you try to demonstrate why. And pulpit and pen for the last several years has done nothing but demonstrate why. It would be a bad idea to join in ministry with those three men and add Charles on top of that. Ad nauseum. And I think we've made a compelling case. Much love to everybody involved. Todd, uh, Dr. MacArthur, Phil, Justin, um, all of those, uh, Josh Bice. I love them all. And they're all really wrong. But I love them anyway. And I love you too, if you're listening. Because unlike Stephen Anderson, I don't believe that we have the right to hate anyone. God will hate who he wants. He loved Jacob. He hated Esau. He'll show mercy to whom he wants to show mercy. And he'll harden who he wants to harden. The God's, God, God is angry with the wicked every day. And he hates all who do iniquity. But I'm not God, so it's a divine double standard. Do you know what the gospel is? The gospel is God very well might hate you. I don't know. That's that's some bad news. Uh, the wrath of God abides on you because you live in sin. And the wrath of God is being poured out from heaven upon the unrighteousness and the ungodliness of men. Romans 1, 18 through 22. So you're in for it. That's the bad news. The good news, though, the good news is that God stepped into flesh, that's what Christmas was about, became incarnate, implanted himself in the form of an embryo inside the womb of a virgin, became one of us. Christmas isn't just about Jesus coming to us, but him becoming one of us. And he lived a life we should have lived. In fact, he undid what Adam did. He earned perfect righteousness and obedience for us by his good behavior. By his obedience, he earned right standing with God. 
And then he got on the cross and all of the sins of everyone who would ever believe in him were imputed to him. And he was struck down in our place, being our propitiation, the wrath quencher of God's anger, the wine press, the fury of the wrath of God overflowed like a funnel down upon the cross, killing the Son of God through the hands of lawless men. And so he took our punishment so that we can take his righteousness. He got what we deserve so we can get what he deserves. And that exchange of our sin for his righteousness that culminates at the transaction caused by faith alone in his accomplished work. And then proving his deity real and his sacrifice accepted, Christ Jesus rose again from the dead. That's the gospel. Thanks for listening to Polemics Report. Sorry I haven't been with you much. It happens, and it's life. God bless you. Support us on Patreon if you can. Also, my project uh, during my sabbatical, uh, Ungodly Mess, uh, How Marxists Stole Christianity in America. Support that uh, by going to the GoFundMe page. God bless you, everybody. Until next time, as always, Simper Reformanda. <laughs>